tell you, it's just a wonderful pleasure to honor to be invited back to the Promise Governance Institute uh, annual conference. And I'm uh, very happy to be here and to see some good friends and make reacquaintances. Uh, my message today, and the paper that I submitted for the anthology, uh, is entitled Deceiving Spirits in America and the Believer's Response. Uh, I just mentioned the anthology. We, we published an anthology, which is a uh, uh, compilation of all of the uh, messages given today. And you'll see in that that uh, everything is well documented, footnoted. When I, when I speak about these various facts today, know that I'm not going to go into footnotes now, but it's be available in print later on. So to begin the message, I, I want to briefly explain that deceiving spirits are present in the government, in the news and social media, and even unfortunately has, has infiltrated the churches and Christian institutions. I'm going to briefly go over a few examples given the limited time I have here today. America's trust in government plunged to its lowest level ever in 2021 as measured by the various polls. It was reflected that only 22% trust the government in Washington to do what is right most of the time. Americans believe that 65% of news and social media is made up and cannot be verified while only 39% of news in the newspapers, TV, and radio, they believe that to be misinformation. This is reported by Gallup and other uh, polls. In plain language, Americans simply don't believe their government and they don't believe the news media, and for good reason. Uh, and that's because, as Christians, we have to believe that they've been infiltrated by deceiving spirits. Before I begin to examine and con compare and contrast some of these facts, we first have to understand the context. In the last election, overall, Christians identified with President Trump and the Republican Party. Now, mind you, I am not endorsing any president or any party, but merely explaining the facts that we have available to us. In the 2020 election, the records indicate that overall 59% of all persons who identify as regular churchgoers voted for Trump, whereas 58% of all persons who identify as not going to any church voted for President Biden. That's a very simple fact that's undeniable. What that suggests is that to the Christians, to the believers, we identify with Trump. And the people in the United States know that. And we know that he stands up for our Christian values. Now, you may not like the person. Personally, I don't like the man. I wouldn't enjoy having dinner with him. I think he's a very flawed character. But we cannot deny that he stands for Christian values. He stands for, for example, defending the rights of the unborn. Uh, he, de he stands for other biblical principles. We're not going to go into the details in the limited time. But we know that he was the candidate of the Christians. Uh, now, mind you, when we talk about these records, these are overall records. There are some obvious some sub subsets that voted more the other way, but generally speaking, that's the record before us. Fifty-nine percent of those who are regular churchgoers voted for President Trump. We see, though, that the Democrat side stands for the principles which are not aligned with the Christian views. Uh, even just today, for example, there, there's news that in Congress today, they're rushing for a vote on the floor of, of the House of Representatives to try to force a bill to go forward to outlaw all restrictions on abortion in the United States. And that's a reaction to the fact that Nancy Pelosi and the people in Congress know that the uh, Supreme Court is very close to overturning Roe v. Wade. And she's trying to come through with new bills to short circuit the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And of course, why is the court that way? Because President Trump, who represented the biblical values, had stalled enough people on the court to move the United States in that direction. Uh, some examples of how the social media uh, and the government have aligned against 
Christian values are as follows. Uh, NPR, National Public Radio, uh, gave a broadcast, or I should say did a publication in January of 2021, uh, January 7th to be exact, where they linked President Trump with Christian radicals, white supremacy groups, and rioting, and used very inflammatory language to, end, to, to, to put it all in the same basket. That it basically to say that people who voted for Trump, people who were who aligned with Trump, were radical Christians, and and were uh, white supremacists, uh, and they did that by a clever way of interviewing lots of people as if to be what's the word, impartial. But they linked all of these interviews with statements of fact that were just plain untrue. So that's one of the ways that we're confronted. National Public Radio is a government-funded radio system. Another example is let's talk about Twitter and let's talk about Google. Both are in bed with the other side against Christian interests and against biblical principles. Twitter, for example, in January of 2021 uh, issued a lifetime ban on the account of President Trump. Unheard of a sitting president of the United States to be banned from Twitter for life. And you can see there on the screen, uh, there's a slide that actually shows the page where you can go, right now you can go on that page and see that lifetime ban. And if you read carefully what it says, it's shocking. The reason they banned him was because he refused to attend the inauguration of Biden. <laughs> Somehow they concocted the inference that his refusal to attend the inauguration of Biden glorified violence. You think I'm kidding, go on the web page and read it. That's exactly what it says. And that will stand for as long as President Trump lives. He's banned for life from Twitter. Now why did they do something like that? Do you think they did it because he didn't want to attend the inauguration? No. It's because he's the Christian's candidate. Because they're against Christian values. They're against him ever getting back in power again and just like as the administration, or I should say the Congress and the radicals were trying to impeach Trump over and over again, this is just another way of trying to impeach his character by doing something like this. So that's Twitter. Let me give you an example of Google. Anyone who thinks that Google is fair and will give you a reasonable and fair, I hate to use the term, Google search, because it's become so much a part of our vernacular, uh, but let's say a search engine, uh, then you're going to be sadly mistaken. If you want to know how honest Google is in dealing with Christians, then I'm going to give you a wonderful experiment. And I don't mind if you pick up your devices and do this right while I'm talking. If you were to run a simple search on Google that says, Biden administration rejects Christian values. Now, that's a query. You can put a question mark if you want, but Google doesn't care about things like that. Search engines don't care. But if you simply want to ask the question, is the Biden administration rejecting Christian values? You would run a Google search, and you would think that in theory you would get back responses that would answer that question. And I invite you to do that. But before you do that, I'm going to tell you, stop a second, and run that search on a different search engine. Now you're going to go, what? Is there such a thing? Now why would you say that? The reason is because all of the best industry information tells us that Google has a 92% market share of the industry. What does that mean? That means that worldwide, any country of the world, whether you are in Africa or China or Europe or the United States or South America, wherever you go, if you do a search engine search to find anything, 92.7% of all of the searches are done on Google. They have so control of the search engine market now. Yeah. But there are other search engines out there. And one of them is, there, there's many. There's two of them you can find that are run by the Chinese organizations. There's one that actually I find to be radically Christian. Uh, but there's two of them that I found that seem very neutral in the middle of the road. One of them is called Acosia and the other is called Dogpile. It's Acosia.org or Dogpile.com. And if you go to either one of those and you first begin your, your search 
with Biden administration rejects Christian values, look what you'll see. These are, these are the ones that I retrieved recently. Uh, the first response from Ecosia.com, Biden administration rejects Trump Pompeo emphasis on unalienable rights. Number two, Biden has already betrayed Christians who voted for him. Number three, Biden and the Democrat socialist policies conflict with Judeo-Christian values. Number four, Biden threatens religious freedom. Number five, persecution fears rise as Biden backs away from religious freedom abroad. Now, whether you agree with those reports or not is irrelevant. You, but you ought to be able to have a right to decide that by seeing honest responses to what you asked for. If you go to Dogpile, you will get almost identical results with some differences. And by the way, I'm giving you the highlights. If you go and do that search, they will give you the actual documents where these reports actually come from to see that these are legitimate sources. And as I say, you may reject or not reject those things. You may disagree or totally disagree. But don't you think that you have a right to actually get an honest answer to the question that you ask? Dogpiled results, as I said, are almost identical. However, now that you've seen what fair responses may be to the question you ask, now run the same search on Google, which has 92% of the market. Run the same question on Google, and these are the exact responses I got, five top responses from, from Google search, and they are as follows. The Trump administration has embraced distorted views of religious freedom, rooted in bigotry. That was number one. Trump administration has harmed faith communities. Number three, no Christian case for Trump. Number four, the faithful voters who helped put Biden over the top and number five, and this was, this was also from that NPR story, by the way. A pro-Trump mob stormed the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Big yellow banners stood out, Jesus saves, as if the Lord himself had been a candidate in the disputed election. The event represented an unholy amalgamation of white supremacy and Christianity. Now, what do you hear about? Now, that's a Google search. You asked for Biden rejecting Christian values, and what you got was nothing but propaganda against Trump. Not one single answer to what you asked for. You have to understand, they write this search engine in such a way to, to deliberately misrepresent and conceal and to keep information from the Christian who wants to find stuff out. What shocks me about this is not so much the responses, but the fact that they get away with it. Yes. They are so arrogant. They know that you can find this, and they don't care that you know you can find it. They have made their line in the sand, and they are going to be anti-Christian, and they are going to be anti-Trump, and they are not going to give you an honest answer to your questions regarding Christian values and what the government is doing to you. So that's what you're stuck with on Google. I've, evangelist Mario Murillo, he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful guy. He's been around for many years. And he recently wrote a book, 2020, it's called Vessels of Fire and Glory. And in it, he describes what we're being confronted with. He said this, deceptive language is how Christians' values are reclassified into hatred. And that's what we're getting, the deceptive language from the government, from NPR, from Twitter, from Google. He says, Christian ideas that are moral and trustworthy become hateful. And he's referring to what we have to do with We as Christians understand that when they're doing this, they're targeting us. We may like or dislike Trump, it doesn't matter. But he stood for Christian values. And when they attack him, it's clear that indirectly they're also attacking us. What's the takeaway from this? We can't trust the government. We can't trust the search engines. We can't trust the radio. We can't trust the media. We as believers have to be able to be resourceful to find out our own information. But unfortunately, the deceiving spirits in America are not limited to the government. They're not limited to the media. They're also, unfortunately, crept in the churches as well. And I'll give you two brief examples. I could talk for hours on this, but we have very limited time. 
Before getting into that, though, I just want to briefly describe the gospel. Because the gospel is the foundation of all Christian beliefs, whether you are as an individual or as a church body or a Christian institution. If you're identifying as a Christian, you should believe in the gospel. You should believe that Jesus lived in heaven for eternity, that he became man, that he lived as a human being, that he was born of a virgin, that he was crucified, died, and was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, and that because he lives, we live. And if you believe in Jesus, you will have life eternal. You obey him, you believe in him. And if you don't believe in him, then what is waiting for you because of your sin is damnation in hell, that hell is real and hell exists. That's the basis of the gospel, and that's the basis of becoming a Christian, and then being a follower of Jesus, you live a Christian life through obedience to the word of God. Having said that, let's look at some things going on in the United States today. Gerald Harris, the former editor of the Christian Index, wrote an insightful article. Now let me preface this by saying that I remember listening to one of my favorite pastors, John Hagee from Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, which is in West Texas. If you spend much time in Texas, you know that. And I heard him preaching over and over again about some preacher in Texas he didn't care much for that he kept calling Reverend Cotton Candy. And I didn't know who he meant. Well, I had an idea who he meant. And, uh, and then I read this article by Gerald Harris, and he says this, and the article is entitled, Cotton Candy Sermons in a Postmodern Age. And he said this, Biblically-based, spirit-anointed, Christ-exalting preaching may be the exception rather than the norm today. And he further wrote, The apostate church is marked by appeasement in the pulpit. We have preachers who pander to the whims and the fancies of their hearers. Mm -hmm. Now thinking about John Hagee, I connected the dots and I present for you Exhibit A, Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen is one of the most recognized mega church leaders in the entire world. I remember when I was young buying his books and reading them. One of his, uh, one of his books entitled, entitled Your Best Life Now has sold over 8 million copies and it's still widely in print and doing very well. If you could imagine if he only made two bucks on each book and, and gave half of it to the government like we all do, he still made eight million bucks on that book. He makes a lot of money selling books. Right now he has, you, you, can, go on Google, you can go on Amazon right now and you will count 24 books in print on Amazon for sale right now. He is a mega book, bookseller. Uh, his church in Lakewood, uh, Lakewood Church in, uh, in Houston, Texas, has an average weekly attendance of 58,000 people. It's one of the largest, it's not the largest, it's only about actually number five or six in the country. There's actually five or six other churches that are bigger than his. But he is very well known. He is the face of progressive Christianity. But unfortunately, as John Hagee and others have noted, he doesn't preach the full counsel of God. And that's a problem. He was interviewed for CBS Sunday Morning, and in that interview, he refused. He said that he would not preach about hell because people feel guilty enough. If you don't preach about hell, and you don't preach about sin, and all you preach about is Christian self-help, like cotton candy, that's not very Christian. But that, unfortunately, is the way the church is going. Exhibit B, my second example for you, is a pastor named Serene Jones. You may or may not have heard of her. She's very famous on the East Coast and East Coast circles. Serene Jones is the president of Union Theological Seminary in Manhattan, which is co-located with Columbia University. Uh, Union Theological Seminary was at one time a very great school. Uh, a leader in schools. It was founded in 1836 by nine Presbyterian ministers who wanted to train other ministers to outreach to the poor people and the needs of people in the urban context of New York City. 
And it has been well established ever since then, right there, like I said, with Columbia University. But this Dr. Serene Jones, who holds a PhD and a Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School, is a person who seems to subscribe more to her liberal beliefs than she does in Christianity. She is the president of this Christian institution. Mm -hmm. And when she was interviewed by the New York Times two years ago for Easter 2019, this is what the New York Times reporter wrote about her. She declined to affirm the resurrection, called the virgin birth bizarre, shrugged at the afterlife, I guess that means going to heaven with Jesus, and generally treated most Christian theology as an embarrassment. I'm only giving you two examples, and don't misunderstand me. I am not going to question the sincerity of these persons. Only God knows their heart. I'm not going to question their intentions, but I will tell you this. What they subscribe to is not the Christianity I know. Right. They are not subscribing to biblical principles, and they are not subscribing to the gospel. And in America, these days, we have to strong firm stand firm, we have to stand strong. In this time of deceiving spirits encroaching everywhere and the population of Christianity getting smaller, we have to hold to what we believe. And it is an indictment on the United States that these large institutions would deviate so far from the gospel, which leads us to the great falling away. The Apostle Paul warned, there will be a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. Instead, following their own desires, they will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an insatiable desire to hear new things. They turn away from the hearing of the truth, but on the other hand, they will turn aside to myths. And that's what's going on today. That's what's going on in the United States and what's going on in the churches today. There is a great falling away today. In the United States, according to the most recent polling, only 65% of Americans call themselves Christians today, down from 78% in 2007. The church is getting smaller in the United States. Gallup recently reported that the church attendance has now fallen to below 50% for the first time in the history of the United States. As it was actually 49%. So the church attendance is going down. The church is shrinking. And given what we're seeing with the media and the government, we are seeing, we're entering a phase where the church is being marginalized, criticized, and abused by the government and by the media. And we can expect to see that in the future, the situation will only get worse and not get better for the Christian body. So I asked you, what are the Christi what what should a believer's response be in a situation like this? What can we do? What can we rely on? The first thing I would remind you of is to know the certainty of your calling. Know that you were born for such a time as this. Amen. 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 When Esther became the Jew who became the queen in Persia, one of many queens a minor queen with little power in that very male-dominated royal society. She became aware of a plot to kill all the Jews. And Mordecai said to her, who knows but that you were born for such a time as this. And she was faithful to her calling and she spoke up and for that reason the Jews were saved the line of the people of God was able to continue because she was faithful for that time that she was born in. And I say to you today that you also were born for such a time as this. Amen. Paul writes to the Ephesians that we are God's workmanship created to do good works. And when did that happen? He also writes to the Ephesians in the same letter that he created us, he had us in his mind from the beginning of time. Yes. Imagine that. You're here now in this time 
in this age, because at the beginning of time, God said, this is when I'm calling you and you and you to be here, because this is the time you were born for. So know that. Don't fret that, well, God's going to take us away in a rapture or something like that. No, you were born for this time. Mm -hmm. This is your time Amen. for the body of Christ to be a believer. The second thing to know is to know that God is on the throne. Psalm 47, 8 says that God sits upon his holy throne and rules over the nations of the world. Revelation says that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Don't fret about the government. Don't say that you're going to be taken away. Jesus said that you are to be in the world, but not of the world. He said he's not going to take us out of the world. I pray for my followers who remain in the world, but they remain strong and steadfast. And along that line, Jesus tells us two words. Number one, that we are salt that purifies. This is in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. We are salt that purifies. Salt doesn't get corrupted. Salt purifies until it loses its strength. So don't lose your strength. And the second thing he says is to be the light of the world. Let your light so shine like a city on a hill. Let your light so shine that your good works glorify the Father. That was the advice that Jesus gave us for a time like this. You don't have to be hostile, you don't have to be confrontational, you don't have to pray that I get raptured away. No, you need to get to work and you need to do good work and you know that you were born for such a time as this. And the third thing I would say to you, which was mentioned earlier, is to consider your weapon. You have one primary weapon above all other weapons and that is truth. The belt of truth. In Ephesians, when Paul talks about putting on the armor of God in chapter 6, he lists all kinds of armor of God. There's a helmet of salvation, there's a breastplate of righteousness, a shield of faith. But the first thing he says is the belt of truth. Amen. That's the first and the most important thing. And why is it the first and the more, most important thing? I'll tell you why. Because truth, so little is written about this, but it's so important to understand Truth is the essence of God himself. Truth is an aspect of God, like goodness, righteousness, creation, beauty, joy, peace. Truth is another one of those aspects of God. And if you doubt that, look at what Jesus said. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And Jesus said, it was for that reason that I was born, that I would testify as to the truth. He said to his believers, the truth will set you free. Amen. Truth is all that's important. Unless you doubt me, consider this one final fact. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, I'm going to pray to the Father to send you a comforter. Mm -hmm. And that comforter is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that comforter will be with you, not just for you apostles, not just for your children and your grandchildren, but he will be with the body of Christ forever. That's what he said. The Holy Spirit would be with us forever. And everything we say and everything we do and every, every success we have is because of the Holy Spirit working with us. And Jesus said something very remarkable. He said, I'm going to send you a comforter. And his name is the Spirit of Truth. That's the name of the Holy Spirit. His name is Truth. Yes. And so when you arm yourself with truth, you're arming yourself with the very essence of God. So I'm going to conclude to you, conclude today by telling you just briefly. Know that you were born for such a time as this. Don't fret about what the government's doing, what the social media is doing. Don't yeah, no, nothing is going to happen to you that didn't happen worse to other believers before you. Right. God is with you. He strengthens you. He called you for this time. You were born for this time. So be faithful for your calling. Arm yourself with the belt of truth and go out there and purify the world and glorify God with your good works. Thank you. Amen.